Uh, welcome to Throw Away Your Xbox. The future of games is written in uh, JavaScript. And uh, I want to get something right off the bat first. Uh, don't throw away your Xbox. Um, I mean, it's OK to like multiple things at the same time. You can have an Android phone and code on a Mac. You can like both pineapple and pizza and eat them at the same time. It's OK. And then you can game on multiple platforms. So uh, with that out of the way, I have a little story. Um, has anyone ever heard of this game? Yep. Um, so that is Apex Legends. Um, Wikipedia defines it as a free-to-play battle royale hero first-person shooter. And if you don't know what any of those words mean, that's OK, because neither do I. Um, and I wanted to play this game with my wife, because uh, I heard interesting things about it. So I started by sending her a message. Actually, I started by changing the th theme to Taylor Swift to kind of make it uh, a little more uh, positive, and send her a link to the uh, Steam store. The Steam is kind of like the de facto um, game store for, uh, for PC. And OK, so, so she goes on to Steam and adds the game to her library. Um, and then she needs to open up Steam. And OK, she forgot her password. Happens to everyone. Uh, we figure that out. And oh wait, Steam needs to update. OK, so we do that. And now, oh, so the game takes 67 gigabytes. So she needs to make sure that she has that space on her PC. And that's fine, because she does. Um, and then you need to download those 67 gigabytes. And it takes a little while from the moment I ask to the moment where she can actually open up uh, the game and uh, pick her favorite character, uh, Wraith, the, interdynam uh, the interdimensional skirmisher, or as my daughter likes to call it, uh, Billy Eilish. Um, and then we can get into the game and shoot stuff. Um, but let me ask you, can we do something better than that? Let's see. This is a game called Venge.io. Just so we can see. Okay. I do have to warn you though, I'm not very good at this. How cool is that, right? Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I realize that you actually want content off of this uh, talk. So uh, fine, fine. Um, so buckle up, and then unbuckle, because that's a tech talk, not a carnival ride. Um, you're probably not going to learn anything that's going to help you with your day-to-day -day, uh, with work in this talk, but your soul. Your soul will soar, or something. Um, so hello, everyone, again. My name is Offer. Uh, I've been playing guitar for more than 20 years, which isn't really relevant for this talk, but I do have this cool image, so it's an excuse to use that. Um, I've been programming for more than 23 years, uh, and I've been playing video games for way longer than that. Um, in my day-to-day, -day, I'm a senior developer at a company called Echo, where we use the technology of interactive video to reshape how e-commerce um, feels and performs online. And during the last uh, decade or so, I've created many, many games and interactive experiences all made with web technology. Um, I've also created the open source real-time multiplayer uh, engine called Lance for enabling people to do our real-time multiplayer games with JavaScript. And um, I did it all because I was uh, lazy. I mean, you have to understand, I grew up uh, learning JavaScript and making websites back in the days when it was used primarily to like 
And knowing people in, induce seizures with blinking text, right? Uh, the websites used to look something like this. Yeah. Um, and, and like, I knew, I knew how to do everything with JavaScript. So I figured I already know JavaScript and HTML and CSS. Uh, why don't I just use that knowledge to make games instead of learning uh, something new? Something new. Um, and I know I'm not the only person who had this exact same uh, thought. Uh, sir, what is your name? David. David. Okay, let's call you did, because that didn't work. <laughs> Later, uh, I also had the same thought. Someday, I'll make my own game. Well, I'm here to show you that you can make web games uh, today. Like, not today, today, because there's still the conference, and there's content going on. But like, generally, soon, yeah? As soon as you uh, have free time and are able. And, and your first original thought might be, okay, the web wasn't made for games. And like, I get that, but uh, neither was it made for uh, email, social networks, video, uh, recrawling, uh, cat videos, and we still do that, right? Um, and games are a thing. If you look at the, the global games market of, uh, let's take 2022, it was more than $177 billion. If you take a look at this graph I liberally edited, it shows that uh, games like Grand Theft Auto and uh, Red Dead Redemption made more money than Hollywood franchises like uh, Star Wars and Harry Potter. Okay, so gaming industry, and this is, this is not a joke, this is a fact, it's bigger than what Hollywood is doing. And there's the whole thing about esports, right? Electronic sports. This is an entire stadium filled with people watching gaming athletes compete. And Esports in 2022 had more than 530 uh, million viewers, and uh, the re revenue was above 1.3 billion dollars. So you know, it's a it's a thing, and you've seen it everywhere. Like it permeates our daily life. There's gaming keyboards, and there's gaming mice, and there's gaming chairs, and there's gaming diapers. Okay, there aren't gaming diapers. I totally made it up, but it could be a thing, right? It's not that far fetched. We, we live in a weird area. When I, I grew up, like the choice was between a beige keyboard and off-white keyboard. And today you can buy you know, Tommy Hilfiger uh, gaming peripherals. Like, how weird is that? That's an actual thing, that's an actual product you can buy. And if, if that's too mundane for you, Gucci is making Xboxes. Uh, these cost like $10,000 a pop, but it's, you know, it's an, it's an actual product that exists out there. So, the point being is that games are big. In general, all games are big. The whole market for games is big. And if you took, take a look at the entire pie of, let's say, the 2021 uh, global markets uh, of, of games, then you see this tiny sliver up the top that says PC browser. So, again, it's like a tiny, tiny bit. Still $2.6 billion. That's just browser games. So there's room for that. So before we talk about like, you know, web games, and I'm freely using that system, I think we need to define exactly what are web games. And, and to completely understand that, um, we need to take a look at the history of what web games were and what are they now. Um, so the earliest example I could find is this thing. So this is like a kind of a puzzle game that you play against the computer, which uh, you pick uh, like uh, one of these uh, rectangles, and the computer picks the next one, and you need to you know, continue picking until uh, you have more blue things than uh, blue squares than the computer has uh, 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 triangles. It's harder than it looks. The interesting thing about this, this is from 1994, is that this is all server side, right? So you see CGI bin here up at the top. This was probably written with like disgusting Perl. Um, and there's no, like there's client side, but the client side doesn't do anything uh, game-wise. It's all server side. Uh, let's take a look at another thing. This is <laughs> uh, a really ancient 
game portal, like when, when the HTML was, used to be a thing, a dynamic HTML. So let's pick, uh, um, let's see, where was it? Um, let's pick, uh, oh, the thing that I wanted to pick isn't here. They've updated it? That is so weird. Oh, there it is. Cross-browser snake. It's cross-browser because it supports both Firefox 1 and uh, IE6. Uh, and it looks a little like this. Uh, and you look, click, uh, let's do it slow. Yeah, and it's snake. And it's a little strange because it's not clear who this website, like what is the target audience for this website? Like is it for people who want to play games or is it for people who want to put games on the websites? Because that used to be a thing. Um, and this is from around 96, 97, if I remember correctly. Um, and then if you wanted to do something uh, more fancy, uh, you had to use the role of uh, web applets. So what are web applets? Java being an example of one of them. It's like a black box where uh, there's a different separate software that runs some sort of logic and the browser just like assigns space to it in the, in the, yeah, the rendering space for it. And it doesn't really know what's going on inside. So and if you didn't have the applet, uh, it looked like this. And if you did have the applet, then one, uh, if you did have Java to run the applet, then once in every two days, it would bug you to install an update. Like I'm not entirely sure what happened in the span of those two days, what new features Java could have possibly added, uh, but every two days an update, that's, a, that's the life. Uh, and there were other uh, sorts of applets, we'll see. Um, one of the more, most famous games that were done with this is called RuneScape. Uh, and RuneScape was uh, like a, a fantasy RPG game, a very early precursor to WoW, if you'd like. Um, it had multiplayer, it had uh, 3D, it was kind of uh, impressive, uh, if you ask me, for the, for the time. This isn't actually a uh, video from 98. This is a newer version, but like there wasn't YouTube on 98, so it's harder to get footage from uh, that era. Um, and okay, so that was uh, Java, but Java wasn't the only applet. We had other applets, we had ActiveX, we had Silver, Silverlight for like a second and a half. And uh, we also had uh, Flash and uh, Shockwave. Um, and uh, Flash, as you probably know, really took off. Uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, Windows XP was bundled with Flash, so we didn't even have to install anything. Um, and some of you may recognize some of these games, right? And there were lots and lots and lots of uh, Flash games. Uh, I mean, they were all over the place. The golden age of uh, Flash games, uh, circa 2005, was, was like a Cambrian explosion of uh, games on the web um, for, for multiple reasons. First of all, it was just a new medium of self-expression. Up until that point, you had to be fairly technical to get like a multimedia experience up and running on the web. Um, it allowed people to publish and bypass the establishing publishing processes. So no longer were you bound to I don't know, finding a publisher, getting your game in a box, shipping it to stores and having people buy it. You could just like do your thing and put it online and then millions of people would be able to see it just by going to a website or you know, being passed around in the email or ICQ or whatever was the uh, popular thing at the time. And like the whole thing was like neatly packaged. So you had the Flash editor, um, which was a suit that could create both the graphics and the animation and later on the code, but it was this, this self-contained thing. Uh, one program that outputted one file that you can put online. Uh, and you, we had sites like Congregate and Newgrounds and all sorts of other sites that were destinations for people to come and play games. And I mean, the, the really cool thing about it, it, it's that we we're saying games, but it was such, a, um, such an amazing experience to see people use it for I don't know, for political statements, for sharing emotions, for just expressing in, in general. And everyone from all walks of life basically could do it. You had like students and you have like uh, just, uh, not just tech people, everyone could do it. But then 27 came, came and with it uh, the iPhone 
and the uh, Steve Jobs letter uh, called My Thoughts About Flash, uh, where he pointed out several, several shortcomings with Flash and like his opinions on like why wouldn't, um, why isn't Flash good for the mobile ecosystem that he's imagining or the web in general. And from there started the slow and painful decline of Flash until around uh, two th I think 2021 was the last year where Chrome supported uh, Flash completely. Uh, but it stopped, like it put it behind flags and behind warnings and whatever. Uh, and it was clear that with uh, the Apple ecosystem not supporting it and with the uh, Android ecosystem slowly starting to not support it, uh, the end would soon come. Uh, by the way, if you're researching the death of Flash and searching for it, you don't find what you're uh, looking for. Um, with that, with the slow decline of Flash, we had um, uh, a slow uh, improvement in the technologies, the web technologies that uh, were available to, to us as developers. So we started seeing things like Canvas, and web workers, and WebGL. Um, and in uh, May, I think, uh, Chrome is shipping WebGPU, which we'll talk about a little later. Uh, is a little exciting thing. Um, and in 2005, this little game came out. It's called agar.io. So in this game, you're this little blob, and you need to eat other blobs to grow larger. And if you're larger than the other blobs, you can eat them. But there are other blobs that are larger than you that can eat you. Um, and this is a multiplayer game, uh, allegedly. Uh, that's a completely uh, different issue, but uh, you can see something that looks like another player, and uh, uh, they're trying to eat you, and uh, Ukraine is trying to eat me. I don't know, that seems uh, like there's a message there. Uh, <laughs> and this thing exploded. Uh, this, I think, like in my personal opinion, uh, uh, opinion was like the precursor of uh, modern uh, web games, often called modern, uh, often called, uh, often called I/O games, um, because of this top-level I/O domain. There are multiple games uh, with this uh, I/O uh, domain these days that kind of signify them as web games. So, I'd say that my definition for uh, a web game is a game that's playable in the browser and implemented with standardized web tech. So, okay, these things exist, there are web games. And you could ask yourself, okay, but why, why would you want to do web games at all? Like, what's the, what's the benefit here? First reason is, like, it has novel gameplay that you can't get anywhere else. So take a look at this thing from Google. It's a little old, uh, but it's called uh, Racer. And the idea is that you load up the URL on physical devices, like a tablet, like a phone, and then each player uh, has their own car, and they race across uh, different devices. And this supports, I think, I pull up to four devices. And the amazing thing here is that they, they are visually and physically uh, synchronized. So you just place them on the table next to each other and play across the different devices. How cool is that? And you see, like, one is an iPad, the other is an Android phone, is an old Samsung. But this thing, you know, you just put any phone from any manufacturer, put in the URL in any browser that supports this, and it just works. Uh, you can't do that with other, like, cross consoles or whatever. It's just not possible. And another thing is that the web allows for, like, rapid prototyping. And, um, and experimenting. So like, you wouldn't upload a half-baked game to, to, I don't know, to the Nintendo Switch store, because like, that's a huge process. But you can hack up something that you've worked on and just upload it to, to the web, even if it's not like this fully, fully uh, complete thing. Uh, and people do amazing things with that. So this, um, this thing came up two, two weeks ago, I think. Uh, by Vincent Lucendo, I think I'm hoping I'm not butchering uh, their names. Uh, but it's just this cute 
Miyazaki-like uh, experience where you kind of get to explore uh, a little town and find out secrets in this thing. And it's, you know, it's very impressive. It's not a full blown game, just a really cute and impressive interactive experience, which I find just to be lovely. And you see, I just put in the URL. Everything you see here is live. Um, so I don't have to read, nothing is preloaded either. So, I mean, uh, another thing which I find super impressive is this Slow Roads. Slow Roads uh, by Enso started out as um, an experiment in uh, procedural generation and turned into a driving simulator. So let me show you my, what I mean. Uh, so you have your car here. And by the way, this works with the GamePad API. This should work with the GamePad API. Let's just see that. Maybe the battery died because it's live demo after all. Anyhow, so you drive on this endless solar world. Oh, I thought, forgot we were in the UK. Um, and like everything that you see here, the hills, the road, is just procedurally generated. Uh, and you can, uh, I don't know, you can uh, drive. Uh, Coach, if you wanted to, let's try to change that to. Uh, where was it? Okay. You always wondered how a coach handles. You can do that. Um, you can go off road with your coach. Well, you can try to do that. Um, or uh, grab a bike. It's an interesting looking thing. And just go, and it. <laughs> interesting. Um, or you can, uh, or that. You can do this in autumn and in winter. And I don't know, I find this so, so cool and uh, mesmerizing. And the fact that, again, you just put a URL and it works. I don't know, there's something about that. Oh, that sounds painful. <laughs> um, okay. So, another reason. A very, very important reason is that uh, it's easier to make accessible games on the web. Um, games like native, native games are notoriously uh, hard at being accessible, so you need to put a lot of effort to make them, and unfortunately, many uh, developing studios don't make the proper effort of making them accessible. And with the web, the web is, you know, it supports accessibility out of the box. So, first of all, uh, we should be writing semantic DOM, so the whole way we structure our data uh, lends itself to um, being um, accessible. Uh, the web supports alternative input methods, so if someone can't use their mouse or other uh, high precision pointing device, they can use uh, uh, you know touch, they can use other assistive devices. Uh, the fact that you write a web form and it just works with the keyboard without you having to do anything uh, in particular, it's amazing. And plus, we have out-of-the-box support for assistive technology, bit magnifying, screen readers, braille readers. So if you follow best practices on the web while making your web game, you automatically make it more accessible. So that's a score of one for, the, for doing web games. Um, and it has web in the name, right? The web was all about connecting technologies and connecting people together. Uh, and let me show you an example of that. Um, this is uh, a company called Dot Big Bang, and what they do, um, it's kind of like a social uh, shared experience where every player gets their own uh, avatar. Um, and they're free to roam around in this world with other people. And the, the, the basic idea is that Everyone can create their own types of games and experiences within this world. Oh, you know, you can do that. 
so let's go to this uh, obstacle course um, and see how that pans out. And again, this is all multiplayer. So if you see other avatars here, they, they are actual people doing this. So this is kind of like a Japanese uh, style, uh, uh, what's it called? Oh. Yeah, like I told you, I'm not very good at those things. Um, and this is a thing I particularly like. So the fact that we're able to connect with other people lends itself to other types uh, of media. So streaming, for example. Um, there is a particular streamer which I enjoy their content. Uh, they, he's called Day9. Um, and he, with, uh, with conjunction with his company, created this game called The Straits of Danger. And basically, the idea is that uh, you've seen streaming, right? There's a person, they play a game, they have a community, the community uh, shares via chat, and like, they all have this shared experience. So, with this thing, the game is that there's a ship, and everyone joins on, like those 20 or 30 people who are supposed to navigate this ship, uh, each by standing like on the proper buttons. You see like, tiny, tiny people here, and they are all like need to stand the ship to steer it right or left or shoot it can, whatever, and avoid danger. All the meanwhile, the streamer uh, controls the, uh, the level and also the camera, so they stream it to other people who are watching but not necessarily participating. It's a little mouthful, it's a little comp complicated. Let me show you how it works in practice. This is what is known as a swarm game. It is not about teamwork and coordination. It is about the hive mind feeling one another out. And this hive mind now has got to go fast because the closing walls... Do you hear them? Do you... What's that? What's that? Arrgh! Go fast! Go fast! Get in there! Go! Not into the wall! Oh my god! Oh! Huh? Go! Backwards! Get! Oh! Go! Fast! We've never seen someone not die very early on in their first run-in with Gotta Go Fast. Ne okay, so you're probably, I mean, we have to talk about the elephant in the room here. This is an actual game called The Elephant in the Room. Uh, and that is, is, like, I know it's cool, but like, is JavaScript the, the way to make games? Well, when you come to think about it, like you have the JavaScript runtime, the JavaScript engine that runs the code in the browser. And that thing sits, like, in the tab space. There's, like, allocated memory and stuff within just that tab in the browser. And, and that sits in the browser. So the browser is an application on the OS, and it has its own... Uh, memory allocation and it shares memory, uh, it competes about memory and CPU time with other application. And that thing as it sits on the OS, which is itself, you know, has its own uh, um, associated computing costs. And that sits on the hardware. So, like, you have this huge stack here that you don't have when you're writing uh, native games or whatever. Um, so, you know, uh, maybe your logical uh, question would be like, okay, maybe JavaScript is not the obvious choice because like, it's a scripting language, it's not pre-compiled, like, it does the comp compilation uh, in time. Uh, it's single-threaded, like we have web workers, but you don't have actual control of threads. You don't have any me direct memory control. You're at the mercy of the garbage collector of JavaScript. It could do garbage collection at really uh, unfortunate times or not at all. Um, you have no direct hardware access, mostly. Um, and plus, like, every browser does things differently, so now you need to deal with cross-browser, uh, cross-device uh, um, issues, and uh, there's a fragmentation, different versions of browsers, so why? Like, why would you do this to yourself? Um, to which I reply, they run everywhere. I mean, that's not, that's not a small thing, that's a huge thing. And, and what do you care about performance anyhow? This game, yeah, I remember this box art. This is a Prince of Persia from uh, 1982, released for the Apple II. Um, 
I know this, this box art is a little cringy, uh, especially for like 2023. It was just sold for $63,000 last week in an auction, like the original artwork. Just a big pit of trivia here. Um, but this was as an amazing game, regardless. It ran on the Apple II. Uh, and the modern browser is like 207 times more powerful than the Apple II. Which isn't true, it's a statistic I just made up. But like, you, you get the point, right? Uh, so if the modern browser is more performant than the Apple II, why can't we just like play Prince of Persia in the browser? This is a, a complete uh, uh, re-implementation uh, of uh, Prince of Persia 4 in JavaScript. This is the entire game. As it was, same bugs and all. Oh, let's get out of here. How cool is that? Also, the thing I like about here is that you have stuff as query parameters, like health and time. I don't know, that's funny. Um, yeah, so. This is a Playdate. It's a console that was released last year that has a physical crank which operates game mechanics uh, in the games itself. This is, and it's, it's great, it's amazing. It's not a console that like, has the best next-gen graphics or whatever, but it has really cool games and, uh, and mechanics, and it's fun. So, I mean, fun is the most important thing here, not uh, whatever technological challenge that the browser may pose. And, okay, maybe that sounds like an excuse. This, Jerse 13 k um, is a competition to make games in JavaScript that fit under 13 k so let's see what people did with that. So there's this game, uh, Ninja vs. Evil Corp. Let me remind you that everything you're seeing, graphics, animation, sounds, everything here is under 13K. So it's like a small, cute uh, platformer, with, uh, like a puzzle platformer, with wall jumping and stuff. Here, right? And you're probably thinking, okay, so I get it. Like, you can do that with 13K. Uh, but, like, what about this thing? This is Q13J, uh, a complete Quake like 3D engine implemented in the browser in under 13K. This is, this is mind blowing to me. Okay, and uh, take a look at this. This is not from 13KJ, but uh, HexGL um, is a racing game. Let's see. <laughs> it's because I didn't open it in a new window, is that it? It's so arrow keys, not WASD. That's my bad. Uh, but it looks amazing. It runs amazing. I mean, how cool is that? So it's not all about performance. Hope I get that, uh, that point across. Um, and we have, we have multiple technologies that help us do these things. Uh, we're not left in the dark. We have for rendering, Canvas, WebGL, WebGPU. Uh, we have the GamePad API, which usually works, just not in live demos. Um, we have persistency with uh, web storage and IndexedDB. We have web workers when we want to do some more performant things uh, in the background. Uh, we have a way to do networking with sockets and WebRDC, which aren't ideal for web games, but there is a new standard called web transport that's uh, being proposed, uh, which would work great for games. Uh, and if you wanted to take your experience offline, say for like on a, on a mobile device, you have PWAs, which leverage service workers to get the entire experience offline. So we can do that. I mean, we have the technology to do that. Uh, it's not all about technology, though. Um, Shigeru Miyamoto, the producer of 180 uh, snowboarding for the Nintendo 64, uh, says you can do, use a lot of different technologies to create something that doesn't really have a lot of volume. So again, it's all about the game. But what is a game, really? So 
A game is a series of interesting choices, says Sid Meier, designer of Floyd of the Jungle. Yes, it's an actual game. Um, basically, it boils down to input coming from a keyboard, mouse, gamepad, whatever. Um, a game loop, which contains the logic of handling that input and the game logic itself. And then an output in the form of video or audio or something else. And uh, let's start by talking about like the output. So the output is usually handled by a some little something I like to call a render. Like I like to call it that because that's its name. But uh, I like to call it that nonetheless. Uh, render is kind of a f funny word. It's like they didn't figure out how many ERs they need in that word. Um, render. Anyhow, rendering engines. Those are the pieces of software um, that are in charge of pushing pixels to the screen. And you already want no one of those. You already work with one of those, and it's called HTML plus CSS. So there have been games that have been made only with that, and pretty, pretty impressive ones at that. So let's take a look at one that wasn't made with CSS at all, just with HTML. Uh, this is Candy Box 2. It starts by you clicking on some buttons to pick up some candies, and then fast forward a little, because it takes a while, because it's kind of like a cook, it starts as a cookie clicker. Uh, but essentially, you request a feature from the developer, and then you get like a menu, and after you request another one, you get a health bar, and then you get a map, and suddenly this turned into a full-blown uh, like quest adventure game, all in ASCII. Again, this is in the browser, so someone made a whole lot of effort to allow you to, uh, to play this using, again, this is web technology, it's a little old, but again, it's a, it's a complete game. Um, Take a look at uh, Pure CSS Stack, which is uh, a game made its own code pen, uh, just with CSS. There's no JavaScript here whatsoever, and the idea is that using some really uh, intelligent form trickery, uh, the idea is that you click until there is no longer space to click, and like you get higher score the more uh, you're able to, like the more layers you're able to do. Um, Another cool thing, uh, The Mine by Jimmy Coulter, is a full blown adventure game in CSS. There's no JavaScript here whatsoever, still with cool form tricks. And I mean, this thing has uh, navigation, inventory, uh, dialogue. It's amazing. Um, and to wrap up the CSS example, there's Lighthouse, which uh, is a puzzle game where you're supposed to make a loud create a lighthouse by kind of toggling on and off certain, um, certain boxes. Uh, I haven't been able to. If you do, uh, let me know how, because uh, I'm curious. But if you want to do more fancy things, then there are rendering engines that do leverage like JavaScript and stuff. Uh, the famous one that I know for 2D is Pixie, which uses WebGL and uh, uh, WebGL and Canvas to do like cool 2D stuff. Um, so let me show you a demo. Uh, you have sprites, you can move them around, you can run like uh, filters on that stuff. Uh, it gives you like a complete uh, JS API to um, have free reign with your, um, with your uh, interactive experience. And of course there are 3D rendering engines, the two main ones being uh, 3GS and Babylon. Uh, 3GS is the most, more popular one, probably the one you see uh, most of. Um, let's see, like a quick demo of that. So the hell of world of G3JS is something like a rotating cube. Uh, you set up like a, a camera and a material and like a, and, uh, and the environment and then you can kind of play around with that and make the cube do go crazy. Uh, but again, it's just code, it's imperative code that runs all the stuff. Oh, and if you, uh, if you add a little more code, then you can get something like this, which is like a complete car visualizer with, uh, you know, transparency and, uh, and glossiness and stuff, and I like to uh, create the 
ugliest combinations of cars that you can uh, possibly imagine. Yeah, but this is all 3GS, right? Um, this. Okay, so we have WebGL, and like I told you, there's something called WebGPU, which is coming soon. What exactly is WebGPU? I mean, I could tell you the difference is that WebGPU runs OpenGL on Metal, on Mac, and then on, uh, uh, it runs on Vulkan, which is a new implementation that's more, uh, more closer than the Metal and better integrated with existing hardware, but it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you can see, or you can figure out that it's, uh, let's see, it's faster. It, this is uh, Babylon doing uh, like a water uh, rendering demo with, uh, with WebGPU. It's supposed to be really faster and better and just better. Doesn't, the details don't, don't matter in, in this uh, particular instance. And you don't have to work with the rendering engine uh, by itself. If you, you're working with a framework like a, uh, React, you can use 3JS Fiber, uh, and if you're working with Svelte, with Threl, then there are other bindings and sorts of things for this thing. Um, okay, so that's just the render, but what, what if you wanted to make a complete game? So the software that wraps everything, like the input, the game loops, the output, all that at the same time, is called Game Engine. Because um, you don't have to really re-implement everything on your own all the time. And there are several of those uh, available that you can or use now. Um, the first of which uh, is called Phaser. Phaser is a 2D uh, game engine. Uh, let's see it, uh, the Hello World example that I prepared. So essentially, right, you have your little character here which can jump, it's kind of like a platformer thing, and can uh, uh, eat those stars, get those stars, and you can play around with, uh, it's not a lot of code that does that, but you can kind of uh, play around with uh, the, uh, the gravity, let's put a negative gravity, and then what ends up happening is that your character gets stuck to the floor, though to the ceiling. Yeah, but it's just, it's not a whole lot of code to create something that's you know, playable uh, from scratch. Uh, I used Phaser to create this game. Wait, okay. It's called Evolve. It, uh, it was an educational tool to help children understand concepts in evolution. Uh, so you have things like mutation and a creature is uh, doing, um, being exposed to different environments and different hazard materials and like, developing traits or populations dying out and that sort of thing. Um, has anyone ever heard about Vampire Survivors? Vampire Survivors was, it looks a little janky, I'll show you the demo. Wait, where was the demo? There you go. Um, but it, it's a game that super succeeded uh, and had like more than 70,000 players, concurrent players on Steam. And the idea is that like you have your character and uh, you there's a lot of lots of monsters and it gets powerful uh, over time. Uh, fast forward in the same sec. And there's lots and lots of mo monsters and again super super successful. Um, this was made with phaser and then just wrapped. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, made with phaser and just wrapped and shipped to Steam and other. Uh, and other stores, which is super cool. It was made with WebTech. Nobody knows that it was made with WebTech. Uh, another engine that I'm really fond of is uh, Play Canvas. This is like kind of like Unity, but for the web. Um, in the interest of time, I'll show you a video and not a live demo. But uh, let's see. This, this, this. There we go. It's a joke because it's about blank. It was, it was late. Um, the idea is that you have your editor with your 3D scene um, and um, you can use that editor to, I'll show you, to edit, again, the experience that you have and then change it live and when you change the editor live, 
uh, the scene changes. So here's some uh, screen, uh, screen uh, resizing magic, because like, it's hard to show this in a demo. Um, let's do it a little faster. Playback speed. Fast. OK. And then you can see that if I create a new thing, then it automatically updates in real time. Uh, but you need to update also the collider and whatever. And if you're into games, you know what I'm talking about. And if not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but the cool thing about this is that it's written in JavaScript. So you can kind of like uh, edit the scripts in uh, JavaScript. So here, just I'm showing you an example of how to do this where it actually works. Um, let's fast forward a little. You can open the code editor. Um, and you can see it's all, again, just simple JavaScript. Uh, and here, this is an example of me coding uh, a way to jump just by adding, adding uh, force in the Y dimension. Cool. You can do that in the browser, right? It's, Again, um, and you might, again, ask, OK, but we already have Unity and Unreal Engine. Like, those exist. Do you need a new thing? And yeah, it's true. Unity and Unreal Engine can export games for the web. But what they're actually doing is taking the exported code, uh, turning it into WASM, which is uh, <laughs> it's this, uh, in short, uh, and then having the runtime be loaded by the browser. So essentially, it kind of feels like the applets of your, right? It doesn't really talk the language of the web, which I'm not trying to gatekeep here. I mean, if you want to do this, do this, and it's cool. There are games that do that. But are these uh, experiences really web games? I don't know. Uh, that's kind of uh, up in the air for me. Um, cool. So. Let's say you, you ran with this, you made a game, now what? Well, if you, were, um, if you were doing a native game, then the obvious next step would be like, to publish it to Steam or like the Apple Store or, you know, or um, on Google Play. But you don't. You're doing a web game, so you don't have those options. It's weird. The slides get like, longer and longer progressively. So um, one option is to put it on your website. Let's do this. This is my website. Uh, and there's this little kind of hidden button here uh, called Create World. And when you click on it, you get like a tiny sim game where you have different creatures walking around it. And these. Uh, they have different traits, and they live, and they each eat, eat each other, and they die, and they have this whole life inside of this thing. And uh, let's see if uh, reloading it makes it makes us look at see another uh, see. get a new world because it's procedurally generated, and you get a new one each time. Well, trust me, it does. Um, and there's this site. Okay, where were we? Got it. This site um, is an online portfolio for Bruno Simon, which is a, the whole portfolio as a game where you can play with this little truck and just run over uh, his work, kind of. I, I, I promise you that I drive better in real life, right? And each of those is a link that you can open. This is pretty cool. Um, and if you don't want to put it up on a website, what just happened? Okay. And if you don't want to put it up on a website, there's HIO, which is a destination site for web games where you can uh, post your own games. Um, and you can also sell them if you wrap them like in an electron or something and then create an executable uh, out of it. Um, your next question might be like, how do I make money? 
with my game. And, and you kind of, kind of can. Uh, the first option is doing this with ads. Uh, but if you don't pay attention, uh, then you get this. Uh, which I don't know, it's to each his own. You're, you're allowed to do that. Uh, personally, I'm less fond of this type of strategy. Uh, the second option, again, not the best option, but it's donations. Some sites do that, ask people for money. If it's sustainable, I don't know. Uh, third option is doing something like, um, I don't know, a micropayment, uh, selling skins or uh, um, cosmetic items or whatever, but that requires more infrastructure. Um, so you might ask yourself, OK, cool, I'm convinced. Where would I start? to make web games today. Um, first research, resource I would suggest is webgamedev.com. It's a relatively new thing, uh, but it um, you know, it's holds much of the relevant information about the engines, about uh, uh, relevant um, uh, articles, about examples. It also has a really nice newsletter that you get monthly with the new stuff that's happening in the space. Um, there is a YouTube channel called the Game Maker's Toolkit, and there's specifically a series there where uh, he s starts to make his own game for the first time, and his learnings, like his own experience sharing what he's going through, is uh, really, really valuable to me. Um, if you want some motivation to go and make your own game, you can always join uh, Game Jam. There is a the global Game Jam just, just now, and uh, a Ludum there, which is also a Game Jam that's been running. Uh, where you take a weekend uh, by yourself or with friends and just kind of like a hackathon around, make a game around a certain uh, topic. Um, I have kids, so the prospect of having two days by myself to code a game seems like science fiction. But uh, I did do that uh, before that, and it was super fun. Um, there's this um, site called the Game Mechanic Explorer, which uh, you choose like, I don't know, uh, homing missiles, and then it shows you how to, how to actually code this uh, missile that, I don't know, missile smoke trails, and shows you the code, and actually lets you play with the demos. Um, so, this is the developer of a game called How to Weigh an Elephant, um, a 1989 DOS games. His name is John Romero, uh, and he says, you might think that programmers are artists. You might not think that programmers are artists, but programming is an extremely creative profession, and I wholeheartedly agree by that. My tip to you, if you start doing that path, is start with something small and 2D, not 3D. Why? Let's take a, an, an analogy. If someone comes up to you and says, um, I know some HTML, uh, I want to make a website, what are the next steps? Your answer should not be, okay, first load up Docker and then spool up a Kubernetes cluster, right? So that's the same idea here. Start small, start simple. Um, web games are amazing. Go out and make them. Uh, I have tons of other examples, but no time. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm uh, at Twitter because like, I don't have the mental energy to move somewhere else, I know. Uh, and don't forget to um, put your uh, notes uh, when you go out. That's the thing. Thank you so much. And wait, before, before.